Um, so welcome back. Uh, it's time now for our second speaker of the evening, Hamish Semington. Uh, Hamish did his undergraduate degree at Cambridge in 2002, then trained as a graphic designer and software developer, which apparently he says is the obvious uh, career path to follow after a degree in biochemistry. Uh, he took up beekeeping in 2012 and became fascinated by it to the extent that in 2017, he left the software company he'd founded to undertake a PhD in plant sciences at the University of Cambridge and the Plant Evolution and Development Lab in the Department of Plant Sciences. He's now in his fourth year investigating how to improve the pollination of strawberries. Today he's going to talk about how pollination works and how research is helping to unravel what bees think about flowers. Again, if you have any questions, please submit them by using the Q&A uh, button that you can find at the bottom of the screen and Bob will be back to speak to Hamish uh, when he's finished his talk. And incidentally, um, Hamish is writing an article about his subject for a future issue of Beecraft magazine. So if you're not already a reader, um, please do subscribe. Uh, well, that's more than enough from me. Uh, so it's over to you, Hamish. Good evening. So yes, thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard, for, for introducing me. It's lovely to be here. Um, and as you said, I'm going to talk about um, what pollination is and the work that we're doing on making crops better at being pollinated. Uh, oh, and I am on the wrong screen again. And is that on the right screen? There we go. Now I can move forward. Brilliant. Um, so as Richard said, I'm a, I'm a PhD student in the fourth year, and our lab works on flower evolution and development. But they have a, a bit of a sideline in um, looking at uh, applied um, uh, areas of this particular research. I'm looking at the pollination of strawberries and how to improve it. So the middle picture there is uh, my little plot at the Botanic Garden where I was growing some strawberries. And in a month's time, I'm going to be putting up a 12 foot by 45 foot polytunnel to grow 380 plants in there. So I'm excited about having more of that bed um, to grow. It's the same bed where um, experiments were done way back um, looking at the, um, the origins, right, right at the origins of the study of genetics. So there's an, a huge history behind there as well. Um, and I work with bumblebees and artificial flowers. So on the right, there's a little picture of my setup at the Festival of Plants at the Botanic Garden a couple of years ago. Bumblebees are really easy to train, um, so we can ask them questions about what they think about flowers, and I'll be talking a bit more about that uh, as we go. So to start out the first bit of this talk, I want to um, go back to a bit, of, um, a bit of biology, which you may or may not remember from school, and just look at what pollination actually is. Um, and to do that, first of all, I want to um, have a look at the structure of a bisexual flower. Um, the process of pollination is simpler in non-flowering plants such as conifers and cycads, but I'm going to look at, uh, look at flowers here and how a flower is built in particular. It's similar for all flowering plants, not just bee pollinated ones. So in the middle, the blue bit in the middle, um, I don't think you can see my mouse, so um, and I can't work out to get a pointer on here, so never mind. Um, but the blue bit in the middle is the female bit, and you've got a stigma on the top, the style supports it, and then right down the bottom you've got the ovary, and the little black dot right at the centre uh, is an egg. That's the female. The male parts uh, are the anthers. The, 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 um, the filament is the yellow part which supports the red anthers on the top, and together they form the, the filament and anther form the stamen, and the anther is a bag full of pollen which bursts. Um, and uh, pollen grains aren't single cells, they're actually three uh, cells. You've got two sperm cells and one vegetative cell within this sort of, um, structure of the pollen grain. We'll come to some of that a bit later on. So the central problem for pollination is how do you get pollen grains from the anther, the red bit, to the stigma, right at the top of that blue column, possibly on a separate flower or on a separate plant. And then when it's got there, how do you get the sperm which is contained in that pollen grain all the way down to the egg at the bottom? It's not, it's, it's not just enough to get the pollen grain onto the top. How does the sperm grain, does the sperm cell actually get down there? Um, so let's have a bit of a look at it. And I just, um, just remember this picture uh, where you've got the stigma, the style and the ovary. And that's going to be a bit important uh, later on. Now pollen comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, you, um, uh, there was a question um, earlier on in Isla's talk about uh, having a look at different shapes of pollen and so on. This is the science of melissopollinology, the study of pollen in honey. There's a fabulous book. I've got it here. You can see my um, 
a photograph, The Pollen Loads of the Honeybee by Dorothy Hodges. It's just such a beautiful book with um, pencil drawings of pollen grains, uh, which, which he did under a microscope. And right at the back, there's a lovely little paint chart of all of the different colours of pollen which bees can have bees bring in. It's quite hard to get hold of now, but it's a beautiful, beautiful book. This, uh, this is actually a, um, a mallow grain, um, or, or a mallow plant, sorry, um, which I photographed with my phone through a 10 times hand lens. It's one of the largest pollen grains that you can get. And you can see the individual white circles of the pollen grains uh, on the left through the lens there. This pollen looks a little bit like you might expect pollen to look. It's round and spiky. Um, it's, um, it's a fabulous, uh, fabulous pollen grain here. Um, the outer layer, which can be spiky, contains waxes and also proteins, which, uh, which, are cause hay, which cause hay fever. And it can be sticky to help the transfer of it, so it can all stick together um, on, on your bee or your, your insect, which is, uh, which is visited. The proteins on the outside help the stigma, the female bit of the plant, detect pollen, uh, which has landed, and start the germination process. And I'll talk a bit more about germination later. And pollen comes in loads of different shapes, which helps people identify things in honey, like I was doing, or in the fossil record. Um, you can, a pollen fossilizes really well because it's pretty much indestructible. Um, so you can have a look at um, strata of rocks um, and, uh, and soil samples and see what pollen was around. It's um, a, a lovely science. Pollen also has pores or fissures from which germination happens. And I'll have a look at a bit more at that a bit later. Here's some more pollen. This is a, an electron microscope picture which I took, and this is of my favourite plant, the strawberry. And um, strawberry pollen, um, it has three fissures. It's called, the, the fissures are called colpi, so this is triculpate pollen. You can only really see one fissure per grain here because they're at 120 degree angles. And I always think these look like uh, those rather nasty little cheap rolls you get in um, uh, cheap restaurants which are trying to be posh. Uh, those little sort of oval um, overall with a slip down the middle. Um, but that is strawberry pollen. So what happens after pollination? The pollen has cut off the anthers, it's got onto your bee or um, uh, gone on the wind. It's been dehydrated when you're doing that, so it's a bit lighter. And then the pollen is transferred to the stigma by whatever means. This is a cutaway section of a tulip stigma and you can see the black pollen on, on the top. So I guess when, um, when thinking about pollination, you think of it as transfer of pollen from one flower to another flower, but that's not it. The, the pollen has got to the top of the stigma, but now you've got to get all the way down that blue style to the, uh, to the ovary and, in, and into the egg. Um, you've got all of this plant tissue between um, the pollen grain and the egg. So how do, we, how do we do that? Well, this is where a wonderful thing called the pollen tube comes in. So first of all, what happens is the pollen rehydrates, it absorbs water from the stigma and enough pressure builds up to be able to, con uh, to construct a pollen tube. And this pollen tube comes out of one of those slits, one of those colpi, uh, which I was talking about earlier. And you can see that here. This is iris pollen. It's got this wonderful tripe-like exterior. Um, and you can see a, um, a, a pollen tube coming out uh, of, the, of the pollen grain there. Now, this is this is being built um, from uh, by the um, uh, um, uh, by the pollen grain itself, um, and it's, it, it is being constructed with cell wall. It's just an extension um, of the pollen grain. Um, signals within the stigma guide it, and they tell it which way to go because obviously they want to germinate and start sending the pollen tube up into the air. That would be hopeless. You need to send it downwards. So there's signals from the female that guide it which way to go. It's quite an unusual cell in that it grows from the tip. Um, very few cells do this. Reap hairs do it um, and, uh, and pollen tubes, but most other cells grow um, all the way over. Um, and it grows through the cells of the style, which is the bit which supports the stigma. That, it was uh, blue in that diagram I showed you earlier. The sperm move too, but it isn't really clear how, because in flowering plants, they don't swim. So the sperm move down this pollen tube and every so often uh, there's a little plug which is put in to make sure that the sperm don't go back up towards the pollen. So the, the sperm stay relatively close to the tip of this pollen tube. And pollen tubes grow really, really fast. So this is a picture of um, a, a plant beloved to plant scientists called Arabidopsis. Um, 
it's a it's a rather weedy little thing, but it has the advantage of it has a small genome. It grows really fast, and you can get foreign DNA into it really easily in the lab. So a little loads of work has been done on it. This is the um, the stigma um, and the style of an Arabidopsis. That's going to be about two or three millimeters long, and this is also tipped over onto its side. So the top is on the left, uh, and the bottom is on the right. So the um, and they we've got here some pollen which has a fluorescent marker in it, so we can see where that pollen is. So this is after a, a little while. The pollen has been put on top of the uh, stigma and then left for a bit uh, and then imaged under fluorescent light. Um, and you can see that as well as the pollen grains on the left, which is the top, you've got what looks like sort of jellyfish tails coming out of it. And these are the pollen grains, which are, sorry, the pollen tubes, which are growing through the cells uh, of the stigma. Um, and it's, it's a fabulous thing to watch. It's also really fast. In maize, it can grow about, at, the pollen tube can grow about a centimetre per hour, um, but it does need to travel about 20 centimetres down, uh, down the fronds of the, um, uh, of the maize. It's an absolutely amazing process. The style also provides nutrition, um, as well as so the signals to grow in the right place, but also nutrition to provide the building blocks of the pollen tube. And eventually, this pollen tube will get down to the ovule, uh, the pollen tube bursts and releases the sperm. Like I said, there were two sperm in there. Um, one goes to fertilize the embryo and one goes to fertilize the, um, the seed, which uh, the, the, the cell, which then becomes the, uh, the fleshy bits of the uh, seed. I'm not going to cover all of that today, but the, the process of um, how all of that works is just fascinating. Um, and I would urge you to go and read your favorite plant science textbook about it. So having had a look at um, the mechanics of pollination. Why do plants make flowers? What, what's the point of making a flower? Why not just um, why not just release it? And the purpose of a flower is to present the plant's sexual organs in a way that is most conducive to the um, uh, to the process of fertilization actually actually happening. Now this could be as on the left with a with a nice little flower with petals and and um, beautifully coloured, um, a beautifully coloured flower which will attract whatever pollinator it is that it wants to attract. Or it could be, um, uh, or it could be to present the pollen in such a way that it's picked up by the wind and the female parts of the flowers in such a way that they're there, floating in the wind, ready to be, um, uh, ready for a pollen grain to just happen to blow on, onto it. Um, in terms of attracting pollinators, it's often by providing contrast with the background so the pollinator can pick them out. There's a huge arsenal of, um, uh, of ways that plants can attract pollinators. There's a, a look and smell as well, um, textures and all sorts. I'll look at some of those uh, as we go. Now, wind pollination requires a lot of pollen. Um, and I hadn't really ever thought about how much pollen wind pollination uh, requires, but I found this fabulous video uh, which demonstrates it. And hopefully we'll be able to get the sound as well. And hopefully if I click, uh, it will start playing. Let's see. This new video from an Action News viewer shows just how bad the pollen is out there right now. Jennifer Henderson says her husband Eric was at work yesterday when he tapped a tree with his digger loader. And you see what happens once the machine taps the tree. It is a pollen storm. Oof. The video was taken off Cedar Lane in Millville, Cumberland County. And all that stuff's <laughs> in my car right now. Just a huge amount of pollen which is released. And the energy which is required to make all of that protein, which just gets dispersed. And almost all of it doesn't do anything apart from irritate people who have hay fever. Um, so that is certainly one strategy. Um, other flowers use a targeted method of delivery. Uh, despite my best efforts, I've not been able to find out what pollen grains these are. They look suspiciously round and yellow. Um, so I don't know whether somebody's just coated a bee in plastic particles for a good photo or not. But, um, but this is our targeted method of delivery. Now, something which really annoys me whenever we talk about pollinators is everyone instantly says, aha, bees. Uh, and yes, bees are one of the insect pollinators, and honeybees are one of the bees. But there are many, many other uh, animal pollinators. It's not just bees. We do have the insects. We've got bees. We have wasps, flies, beetles, all sorts of different things there, not just honeybees. Um, but let's have a look at some of the other animals which, uh, which pollinate. We have bats, which pollinate cactuses. 
Uh, birds, there are loads of plants pollinated by hummingbirds. Uh, my favourite uh, science fact of the day, uh, lemurs, the traveller's palm, um, so lemurs pollinate the traveller's palm and lemurs are the world's largest pollinator if you don't count people who have to pollinate um, uh, vanilla by um, Getting slightly more obscure, honey possums, gerbils will uh, pop, um, pollinate African living that has a, a loads of sort of jellyish nectar. If you think about it, when you're trying to get a mammal to pollinate your, um, your flower, you need to give them an enormous reward for doing so, otherwise they'll go and find something else. Second oddest um, pollinator, the New Zealand Christmas tree is pollinated by a lizard. Um, and possibly my favourite one, um, slugs and snails. Um, some types of ginger and maybe some potato plants are pollinated by slugs and snails. Now, um, you may know that uh, plants pollinated by, by bees, I think it's melitophilus plants are pollinated by bees, that's the word for it. The word for pollination by slugs and snails is malacophilus. Um, and if you look at the, the derivation of that word, it's from malakos, which is the Greek meaning soft. So it's, it, it's the Greek for pollination by soft things, which just makes me shudder a little bit. Um, there were some fabulous um, photos um, in the news, I think it was a couple of months ago, about a lizard pollinator. Um, it was this plant with a really obscure little green flower right at the base of the plant, and they had no idea what it was that was pollinating it. They set up camera traps. And they thought it was mouse pollinated, so they set camera traps at night, couldn't see anything. Then they set them during the day, still couldn't see anything, and it turns out that the traps they were using were being triggered by infrared sensors, um, which detect warm-blooded animals. But lizards are cold-blooded, so they didn't see anything there. Um, and eventually they happened to get footage um, of this lizard pollinating the flower, and they've, they've proved it um, by showing that the lizard does uh, retain pollen on its nose and transfer that over. It's really, really fabulous footage. And it took several days for them to trek up into the mountain to, with all of their kit to be able to set all of this up. I think it was also while they were on holiday as well, but, but this is the sort of thing that scientists do when they're on holiday. Anyway, moving on. Um, Bees can't really see very well. Um, bumblebee and honeybee vision is about a, a hundred times worse than ours. They can reliably detect objects about the size of a thumb width at arm's length. If you hold your um, arm up and have a look out, if you put your thumb up, then you'll, that's about the size that a bee can detect. Anything smaller than that, they can't really see. Many nectar guides, which you might see on plants, are there for really close-up work. That's when a bee has or an insect has got onto a flower, it's showing them the way to the nectar and the good stuff. They, um, they can't really see anything at all below a third of a thumb width. They also can't change focal distance like we can. So I can look out into the garden and focus on the streetlight over there and then look back here and focus on my screen. They can't do that. They only have a fixed focal length. So at the top row, we've got human um, visible flowers. And in the second row, we've got a bee vision of those flowers approximately. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to approximate what bee vision looks like to a human because it, it's like trying to describe the colour red to somebody who has never seen the colour red. Um, but, um, but this is a, an approximation of it. Um, the third row is what it looks like from a couple of centimetres away to a bee. So you start to see this blur. And then the fourth row is a bit further away still. Um, you've got two and a half, five, six, and six centimeters. So again, you're getting really fuzzy. And then by the time you get to about 10 centimeters away, 10, 15 centimeters, you just get this sort of blob um, of there's something light over there. Um, so bear that in mind where, um, with the experiments which I'm going to be showing you on. Um, bees do have three color receptors like us, um, but they lack a red and instead they have a UV receptor. They can see some red. It's often said that bees can't see red at all, but they can see a bit because the, the green receptor has quite a long tail over into the red region. Um, butterflies can see red. They've got four types of receptor and dragonflies are amazing. They've got 32 different types of receptor. Um, so dragonflies are about twice as efficient as great white sharks and four times as efficient as lions at catching the prey once they've decided to, um, to go for it. Amazing, the um, efficient predators. Okay, so we, we know bees can't see very well. So let's have a look at how flowers uh, attract those pollinators. First of all, we've got some sexual deception. And this is a flower which our lab um, works on quite a lot. It's from South Africa, from the Macquila. And it's called Gorteria diffusa. It's the beetle daisy, and the flowers are about the size of a 50 pence piece. 
there's lots of different what we call morphotypes, different varieties of this um, flower, and they're all in particular areas within the macroland. Um, but this one in particular is interesting because it has spots on a couple of its petals. And the research we're trying to do is finding out um, what the spots are for, how they're made, why there's only spots on some uh, on a few of the petals. These spots look remarkably like a female fly if you're a male fly. They're not just patterns of colour, uh, there's ruffles on the petal surface. You see you've got this nice little white spot right in the middle of the black bit and that looks like the sun reflecting off the female fly's um, thorax. Um, and um, yeah, they've got these little ruffles on the, um, uh, on the petal as well. And what happens is a, uh, a male fly will come along and think, aha, there is a female fly there, I shall go and mate with it. And they go and try and mate with the flower. Um, they blunder around trying to mate with it, but it's only a petal, so they can't. They get some pollen on their head and eventually they leave unsatisfied. And they will then head off and try and find another one. And they'll probably find another flower and think, aha, there is a female fly there and try and mate with that. But they can't because it's a flower. And in that way, they've transferred the pollen over uh, from one flower to another. Another example of sexual deception is the bee orchid, Ophrys. Uh, most um, in this genus are deceptive. Uh, and to a male bumblebee, this looks remarkably like a very good looking female bumblebee. Um, and you can see that if you squint, you've got a couple of legs on the side, you've got a head pointing up to the centre of the flower. Um, this one actually smells like a female bumblebee as well. Um, and it's got uh, some more textures too. And you can see uh, males trying to mate with it. But this one has no reward at all. There's no nectar, no pollen on which the, uh, the bee can access. So he, um, he will just leave feeling somewhat, uh, somewhat unsatisfied. So this gives a really interesting question. What if bees evolve to look different? Um, what if a bee learns to tell the difference between bee and orchid? In that case, the orchid would get no pollination. So the orchids need to evolve too. You get this um, uh, race between the two of them. It's fabulous. We've got smell deception. This is one of my favourite plants in the Cambridge Botanic Garden, Deherania smaragdina. Um, uh, that, that comes from the Latin for the word emerald. Uh, it, I love getting children to go, look, you can see that, that flower there. That one's green. It looks the same as the leaves. Come on, go and, go and smell it. See what it smells of. And they take a big smell of it and they come away thinking, oh, that's disgusting. And that is because this is the dog mess plant. It smells of poo. And that is there to attract flies, which will come and blunder around thinking they're going to be able to find somewhere to lay their eggs but they can't, uh, and instead they just uh, leave with a dusting of pollen on them. Or you can just have a really big, bright display. Um, this, an enormous great flower pointing out, uh, um, pointing out for the bees to go, or the insects to go and find. Um, when I was giving a practice version of this talk to my boss, I, I went through this slide and, she did, and her comment was, oh, that's not really a flower, is it? And it's true. Um, so here is the other fact. This is, um, it's downhill from here on after, um, uh, after this for scientific facts. But um, a, a sunflower, and in fact, all daisies are not just one flower. This is thousands of flowers. Each petal on the outside is one large asymmetrical flower, which is thrown out one petal. Um, there's actually four fused petals, but uh, it's thrown that out to the side. And then in the center, each um, thing which gives rise to one seed is one flower. You've got your um, your ray florets, which um, do the uh, do the big petals on the outside. You've got your disc florets, which do the um, the little ones on the middle of them. So if uh, if you want to amaze people, you can say that a daisy is not a flower. Uh, and there's uh, yeah, there's some examples of those flowers. You can see um, on the left, you've got um, one enormous petal, and on the right, these are the little um, disc florets, which give rise to the seeds. So. Flowers have lots of different colours, pinks, yellows, reds, purples, lilacs and so on. And flowers are there to make, uh, for, uh, for insect pollinated plants, they're there to make contrast with the background in terms of smell or with colour and shape and so on. Now plants make pigments, red and yellow in particular, and this can be controlled really quite finely. So you can see there's this beautiful yellow, white, uh, blue patterning on the flower in the bottom right. But it's not just visible light. This here is a dandelion, which I picked from just outside the plant sciences department when I knew that we had an ultraviolet camera to play with. And here is the same flower viewed under ultraviolet light. Now, it's really important to note that this is not the same as fluorescence. I'm not shining an ultraviolet light on it and watching it glow. This flower is absorbing ultraviolet light in the middle um, in the same way, uh, sorry, and reflecting ultraviolet light around the edge in the same way that invisible light is reflecting yellow and absorbing, for example, green or blue. Um, if I had a camera which showed me just blue, I would see a black 
flower um, in a monochrome image, if that makes sense, because it's absorbing all of that blue light. Uh, so it's reflecting all of the yellow. Now, making colours um, is energetically quite expensive. Um, in the, um, and yeah, so the flowers want to make lots of different colours. In particular, blue is a really good colour for bees to see, but a tree blue, not purple, tree blue is really hard to make because it requires very difficult cellular conditions, it's very acidic. The, the plant on the left is uh, Meconopsis, the Himalayan poppy, um, and that's one of the very, very few truly blue flowers. It's, it's absolutely stunning. There's a beautiful collection of them up in Pitlockery if ever you go up there, if we're allowed out again. So there's another way of doing it, um, and on the right you can see a um, a tulip, Queen of the Night, and this is iridescent. You can see that sheen over it, and that will give you a slightly blue sheen. Now, this is not a colour in the petal. The pigments in the petal, petal are purple close to black. Uh, so this is a, a way of making colour which is not to do with pigment. It's all to do with structural colour. This is caused by ridges in the cuticle, the layer of waxes on the surface of the petal, and this buckles as it grows. If we zoom in, you can see the, the little ridges, and if we zoom in even further, you can see they're really, really nice and even. Um, and it's these ridges which interact with light um, to, uh, to produce this sheen. They interact with light in a very similar way to a CD. So here we have uh, two pictures, one of um, a tulip on the left and one of a CD on the right. And you can see that the, um, uh, the, the ridges are a very similar size between tulip and cedar. Ignore the one on the bottom, that's just a cross section of the tulip. Um, at the top of the two ridge pictures, so underneath the picture of the tulip and the CD, but above the ridges, you'll see the, um, the iridescence pattern, which is produced by the ridges. And with the CD, you can see a little rainbow, bit, blue going all the way through to red. But with the tulip, what it's doing is giving you this blue halo um, and um, but it's it's not doing the red or anything like that, and that's because um, or that we think it's because blue is such a useful colour to attract pollinators um, that the plants have been able to evolve away from um, the red and evolve into the most um, uh, the most efficient way of attracting pollinators. So it evolved out the ability to diffract red, and it's just uh, um, evolved. It just kept the blue um, uh, the ability to iridescent blue. Okay, so we've got all of this stuff to do with um, uh, to do with flowers. How do we test if it's even useful? And uh, you may be pleased to hear that I'm actually coming on to some research here rather than just background. And the way we can test it is with differential conditioning. And usually if I were giving this talk in person, I would try and differentially condition one of the audience. Um, but um, given it's virtual, I'm going to try and differentially condition all of you. So here I have some um, little spots. I've got three orange spots and three green spots. And I would like you to pick one of those six. Doesn't matter which one, just pick one of them. And you're aiming for the nice, tasty, sweet reward. OK, you picked one. Good. OK, I will now reveal which ones have the reward. There we go. Those ones have the reward. Now, with the ones which aren't rewarded, I could either put nothing there or I could put a punishment. And in this case, I've got a punishment for you. So bad luck if you chose one of the orange ones. OK, let's uh, let's try all of that again. Let's see. Um, uh, pick another one. Uh, please try and pick a different one, but it doesn't have to necessarily be the same color. It's up to you. OK, when you've got one. There we go. So remember, you're trying to get the reward here. Um, we're working on the principle that bees aren't masochists. Try again. Which one are you going to go for now if you want the nice sweet cord? There we go. Try again. Which one would you like to go for? There we go. So hopefully by then you had started picking the green ones, um, assuming you wanted a picture of a nice gem. Um, and I had, uh, I, I would guess I had differentially conditioned most of you, if not all of you, to pick the green ones there. And it's exactly the same with a bee. Uh, we can just differentially condition her uh, and then test um, test what she thinks. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, how we do that now. So here is our bee lab. Um, we buy colonies of bumblebees. They um, get shipped over from Belgium, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. They just turn up in a small buzzing cardboard box and terrify the receptionist. Um, and we have a gated tube, which is where you can see the tube going from the cardboard box into the wooden flight arena, which is about a metre by 80 by 30 with a perspex lid on top of it. And we can see what's going on in there. 
but they cannot yet tell which uh, bumblebee is which. Um, so we glue queen marking uh, stickers to the top of them, and that lets me uh, know which one I'm working with. Um, everyone's always fascinated by how we do this. So uh, I catch a bee, put it in a little tube with a foam plunger and press her up against a, a mesh and then super glue on one of these, um, uh, one of these little discs. Um, I'm going to skip over that slide. Um, so these bumblebees are flower naive. They've never seen a flower before. And we can train them to visit artificial flowers, which are just plastic discs. Uh, with little drops of sucrose solution, little drops of sugar solution, right in the middle of those flowers. So here we are training them to some pink discs. And after probably about 20 minutes, they'll learn that if they go to one of these pink discs, they can get a sugary reward. And so that's how we train them that these, um, these little plastic discs um, are good. Now, in the same way that I punished you for whatever choice it was that you made back there, we can, if we want, also punish bees, which is a rather sort of sad thing to be doing in our, in our research. And I try not to do it uh, too often. So we reward them with sugar. We punish them using quinine. Um, it's a bit stronger than the quinine in your gin and tonic. It's a thousand parts per million, whereas the gin and tonic is up to 87. Um, and bees really do not like the taste of quinine. If they, um, if they dip their tongue into it, they'll start stropping their tongue with their front legs and trying to get, the, uh, get it off. They really, really don't like it. So let's have a look at how we test pollinator responses. Um, on the left hand side, we have a bumblebee. And you'll see I've got a few discs. In the top left, we've got a pink disc. Top right, we've got a yellow disc. Bottom left, we've got a blue disc. And bottom right, we've also got a blue disc. And what we've done, um, there's some other discs further on. The pink disc top left and the blue disc bottom right are not iridescent and they've got quinine on them. The blue disc bottom left and the yellow disc top right are iridescent and they've got sugar on. So we're rewarding the iridescent discs and we are punishing the non-iridescent discs. And there's only a little bit in each, only, um, only one drop in each. And we let out a bee and we watch what she does. She forages, flies, forages, flies, and we record which discs she go to. Now, she doesn't know at the start of the experiment which discs have sugar and which discs have the punishment. So she'll start out by visiting several iridescent discs and several non-iridescent discs. If she can tell the difference between the two of them, then she will start only going to the iridescent discs and to not going to, uh, not going to the non-iridescent discs because she can learn that iridescence equals reward and non-iridescence uh, means no reward. And that's what happens. If you look at the graph on the right, uh, the y-axis the, um, is the number of correct choices and the x-axis is the number of choices. And after about um, 60 choices, she's up to about 80%. After about 80 choices, she gets a little bit higher. Um, so iridescence is not something which is a, is a perfect cue. They can't always see it. But this trend upwards away from 50-50 means that they can see this iridescence, which is a really good start. So they can see it but can they make use of it? And that is where this uh, experiment testing foraging efficiency comes in. But yeah, just because they can tell the difference between two things, it doesn't mean it's useful. So what we have is three um, of these artificial flowers in an equilateral triangle. Use a little bit per disc and time how long it takes the bee to fly between the first one that she lands on and the second one. So she comes out, lands on a disc and has a drink, and then when she leaves, we time how long it takes between leaving that disc and going to the next one. And she'll have more of a drink. And when she leaves that, we time how long it takes her between leaving that disc and getting to the next one. And what we do is we start out with the non-iridescent discs. And we'll do that for, let's say, five goes. Um, so we'll have 10, um, 10 measurements for that B. And then we'll switch the discs for the iridescent ones. And we'll do exactly the same thing with the same B and see if um, she is able to um, um, uh, see, yeah, see which one she can use faster. And here's some results of it. There are pairs of um, bars here because we're looking at the time between the first and second disc and the time between the second and third disc. But just amalgamate each of these two bars in your mind. So on the left, uh, one and two, uh, this is moving between the non-iridescent discs and it takes her about four seconds. And if we add a film which looks like the iridescence on a CD, um, it takes her about three seconds to go between the, the discs. So um, this is from 
uh, 30 Bs with five uh, trips each. So this is there's, there's quite a lot of, um, of data behind this bar graph. So from this, we can tell that bees can find iridescent flowers faster than they can find non-iridescent flowers. And this goes some way to explaining why flowers might have been keeping this iridescence. But the really cool thing is if we then put a, um, uh, instead of a CD film over the top of it, if we put a cast of a tulip petal over it, so the iridescence, uh, you remember the iridescence was slightly different. The, the CD had the full rainbow, the tulip just had the blue. If we put a cast of a tulip petal over it, it goes down even further. So um, we can say that the iridescence which the flowers have evolved is better than the iridescence produced by a CD for helping bees move or yeah, well, helping bumblebees move between flowers faster. Oh, yeah, almost about half the time. Now this blue halo, this iridescence didn't just happen once. Um, it's multiple instances over several different families. Um, you can see that there's a, a, a cartoon of a plant family tree there. Uh, and we've tested loads of different ones. There may well be more, we just haven't tested them, limited to what was in flower in the botanic garden at the time. So it's all the way over this plant family tree. So in the last bit of the lecture, lecture talk, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, food security and my research um, into, uh, into strawberry pollination. So we need pollinators uh, for our food. About 35% of global food production by volume comes from crops that depend on animal pollination to some extent. Um, the main ones, rice and maize and wheat and sorghum, don't need uh, pollinators because they're wind. But lots of it does. Coffee and chocolate, apples, strawberries, kiwis, beans, all sorts. Um, and it, yeah, it's been estimated that about um, a third of our um, food depends on animal pollination to some extent. Now, obviously, plants can self uh, and self pollination um, just by the plant, uh, by the flower moving around, um, does um, does account for quite a lot of pollination. But particularly in um, plants like strawberry, insect pollination will improve the yield and it will improve the quality as well. The world population is growing. At the moment, we have about seven and a half billion people um, on the planet, and it's going to rise to about 10 billion by 2050. We're going to need to find more food, and therefore we're going to need to find more pollinators to provide pollination services for that food. But as you've probably read, wild pollinators are generally in decline. Um, it's really, really difficult to find studies on this because you need well set up studies which have been running for several decades, and there are very, very few of those. Um, well, here we're talking about wild bees and wild insects. Um, honeybees themselves are absolutely fine. Um, I think the number of honeybee colonies in the UK has doubled over the last 10 years. Um, personally, I get quite annoyed by people who say they want to, or by companies who say they want to save the bees and then put 10 honeybee hives on their nature reserve. That's not going to help anyone. That's going to take um, forage away from wild pollinators. They need to be encouraging wild pollinators onto their reserves. Um, and this decline is a mix of causes. You've got climate change and habitat loss and forage quality and pests and insecticides and all sorts of things there. How do we tackle this? It's a really complex problem. We can increase the flower rich habitat. Um, we can do ecological research to target flower provision for particular pollinators or research into how crop flowers benefit or hinder pollinator communities. You can think about enormous fields of oilseed rape. Uh, which provide a fantastic uh, pollen nectar resource for a few weeks at the end of April or beginning of May. Um, and that's it. Um, so there's, there's research into that. That's zoology and ecology. Uh, I'm looking at improving plants. And um, I'm looking at symmetry and color and size and the nectar reward that they produce, the nectar accessibility, uh, the petal texture spots and so on, um, to see what um, in, this, in my case, bumblebees like about flowers because crop plants are usually bred for yield and taste and disease resistance and drought resistance and shelf life and not with pollinators in mind at all. So can we make better use of the pollinators? And I'm using strawberries because they are easy to grow in the botanic garden and um, they, uh, the fruit is improved by insect pollination, particularly by wild insect pollination. So. I can measure flower size and flower perimeter and the pollen count and the nectar quantity and concentration in lots of different varieties of strawberry. And when I found the extremes of variation which exist naturally uh, within the varieties that we've got, 
then I can use B um, experiments, which I've described before, to test B responses to those extremes. And then I can go back to the plant bees and say, if you want bees to be able to find flowers faster, you need to make them look like this. Now, we could perhaps use GM to change flower characteristics and see what bees think to those, but of, um, of course I'm not allowed to grow those outside, but it would help us to see if it's useful um, when I'm testing them in the bee lab. At the moment I'm not doing that because it's a really, really complicated thing to do. I'm just using artificial flowers. But to start out I need to do all of these measurements. So I did some literal field work in a field. Uh, this was in the middle of Kings Lynn. Um, there are, uh, I think, 210,000 strawberry plants in this field, and I was there for six weeks, uh, me and a chair and a radio and a camera um, and a map of the field because uh, I can't tell strawberry varieties apart. Well, I couldn't, but then I can now. Um, and sometimes it goes wrong. Sometimes I go there and it's chucking it down. I have to come home. Um, but I was able to measure. Um, it was uh, 90 flowers from each of 21 different varieties. I, I took photographs of them. And one of the things I'm looking at at the moment is flower wiggliness. So the, uh, I've got two artificial flowers here, or two outlines of artificial flowers here, and these are based on measurements which I took in the field. Both of these have the same area, and obviously it won't make any um, sense on your screen, but the area of both of those when I um, made these artificial flowers is the average area of all of the flowers which I looked at. So that lets me, um, uh, that, that controls for that. And the wiggliness, uh, sorry, so, the, so the area of both of those flowers is the same. That's important to note. And then the wiggliness, um, on the left, you've got the 95th percentile of flower outline wiggliness, um, which is actually a mathematical calculation, um, which I was surprised to find. And on the right-hand side, that's the fifth percentile of flower wiggliness. That doesn't really look like much, to be honest, um, but, it has been shown that bees prefer more wiggly flowers to less wiggly flowers, but it's never been tested with actual field realistic data. They've only done it by cutting the edges off um, existing flowers. So I thought it would be a fascinating thing to have a look at to see whether we can make use of this. So I'm using that triangle setup, which I showed you, and I start out with smooth edged flowers so on the left, that are the less wiggly ones, and I time the bee going between them. And then after a while, I switch them over to the wiggly edged flowers. Uh, and I time the bee going between those. So far I've done 20 bees. Each bee takes about five hours to do um, because I have to do 15 rounds of training and then five on the smooth edged flowers, one um, to get the bee used to the wiggly edged flowers and then another five on the wiggly edged flowers. Um, yeah, it takes about five hours. I'm on my own in the bee room. Um, we're not allowed more than one person in there at the moment, so I have the radio. It's immensely tedious. Um, and for each bee, I come out with uh, 20 measurements of less than four seconds. But it is looking like bees can find the wiggly edged flowers about 10 to 20 percent faster than the smooth edged flowers. It may not sound like much, but um, it's actually quite a lot when you think about it. If we can speed things up by 20 percent, we we can pollinate an awful lot more crops in the same amount of time. So this is that's actually a really, really heartening result. Um, I just got 10 more bees to do from another colony before I can um, start writing this up. And where I'm uh, getting close to the end of time, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the reward that we have as well. If we can make the plant more rewarding for the pollinator, um, then it will be more likely to visit it once it's learned about it. Um, and the reward can be in terms of nectar or pollen. Now the nectar, um, uh, calculate, oh, sorry, the nectar measurements are both volume and concentration. There could also be sugar composition and other components, things like neonics or nicotine or other alkaloids or things like that within the, uh, within the nectar. So there's all sorts of stuff there, but it's easiest to look at volume and concentration. Those are both measurements we can very easily take in the lab. Now, a previous PhD student in our lab, Emily Bales, looked at variation in nectar volume in field beans. And here we have a graph of it. Ignore the colours, they're to do with stats for a scientific paper. Um, the x-axis is lots of different lines of beans. So think of those different varieties. The y-axis is the nectar volume, and this has been log transformed. Um, don't worry too much about why, but it, what this shows is that there's a huge variation in the amount of nectar that different varieties of field bean produce, from about 10 microliters, which is the size of a sort of normal drop of water, right the way down to about one millimeter cubed. So there's huge variation. There's also variation in nectar concentration. 
uh, it can go from um, something like 55% in, um, in the strongest nectar, right the way down to about 15% in the weakest. So there's huge variation. And the really cool thing is there is no correlation between volume and percentage. So that means that we can breed for both of them separately. If we want, we can breed for uh, flowers which have a high concentration of nice and sugary nectar. I'm going to skip over these ones um, just because I'm uh, a bit short on time here. So, um, uh, but I'm sorry, but those ones are um, the size I just skipped over there. We're talking about um, vomiting rates in honeybees. Nobody had ever looked at vomiting rates in honeybees, and so I decided to have a bit of a look at that. It was quite fun research. Um, it's it's all to do with the fluid dynamics of how bees drink, but also how bees um, uh, vomit up the nectar when they get back to the nest. And if you're wanting to have a look at, uh, at that, there's a lovely article which was written about our research in the New York Times. So if you search for New York Times bee vomit, you'll find. Uh, find that article it's really really nicely written so if we can improve crop plants to be better for bees in terms of the reward offered more nectar uh, stronger nectar more pollen we might be able to help local populations increase and as a stealth result of trying to improve pollination for ourselves help local populations of insects release if we have a longer flowering time to support the forage throughout the year and that will all help us also grow more food for us uh, and feed all of those mouths in the year to come so that's the end of the, uh, the research. I have a few acknowledgements. Um, Beverly Glover is my supervisor um, and she's been absolutely fabulous. She directs the Botanic Garden as well. So I'm in such a great place in Cambridge to be doing this. The iridescence work was done by Edwige Maru and Sylvia Vignolini. Um, beautiful work there. Emily Bales did the work on beans. Uh, she's a PhD student in our lab. And two other PhD students, Jonathan Patrick and Jake Mosscrop, have given lots of interesting bee chat and um, advised on experiments. Uh, the Glover Lab and Botanic Garden staff have been really helpful with getting the experiments up and running. Um, I've also used fairly, quite a lot of pictures in this talk, um, and I've tried to credit them wherever I have found them. They're all open source and available on the internet. And finally, funding. Um, I'm government funded um, by a research council, so I, I have four years of funding to go and do my PhD. Um, but I'm funded by, uh, that all comes from taxpayers. So um, I'm, I'm funded by taxpayer money to be able to go and uh, go and look at all of this. Um, I consider it a massive privilege to be able to spend four years of my life looking at this and I think it's playing around with strawberries but I, I try to explain it in a way which actually means that I'm doing some useful work. Um, so um, if you are a taxpayer, um, thank you ever so much for allowing me to do this. It is some of the most fun I've ever had and I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm sorry for going slightly over time, um, but uh, hopefully there'll be some uh, interested questions or perhaps silence, you never know. But thank you very much indeed for listening. <laughs> thank you. Oh, 51 <laughs> questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some of them are Eilers, that's all right. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Hayush. That was You're uh, very welcome. You. Yeah, that was very, very good. Um, though I'm not quite sure that uh, I like the, the phrase of bee vomit um, <laughs> because we put it in jars and ask the public to buy it off us. <laughs> that's, that's, honey is slightly different, but they, but for bumblebees, they they don't they don't concentrate it at all, so they just go back to the um, uh, yes, yeah, they just go back and uh, hoik it up into into a little honey pot. Yes, I do have a few questions and a few comments. Um, that book that you you lifted up earlier, Dorothy Hodges, um, you can get your own copy for three hundred and ninety five pounds. If you, <laughs> yeah, my uh, my my dad yeah. bought this in uh, nineteen seventy nine, and he gave yeah, it to me in twenty fifteen. It's um it, it's appreciated in value, uh, but I should be slightly should more careful. Mean, yeah, I should just mention that the line drawings are available separately from Ibra. International Bee Research Association uh, quite reasonably um, so you don't have to spend £395 to get the benefit of Dorothy Hodges's <laughs> beautiful, beautiful line drawings. Um, we do have many questions. Um, one, one person asks uh, how successful is pollination once the pollen has actually reached the stigma? You know, what percentage get it, make it from the stigma to the to the actual embryo? I, I would say um, I'm going to hedge my bets here and say it depends on the plant. Yeah. Um, I know that um, 
there are some plants where pollen tube um, growth is inhibited when another pollen tube is growing. Um, the pollen tube growth is often where self pollination inhibition works. So mm -hmm. for plants which can't self, um, the, the pollen will germinate, it'll start, it'll start growing a tube and then that'll stop. Um, it's really complicated biology um, yes. and way deeper in plant sciences than I um, <laughs> am, <laughs> than I have got myself with, yet. Yeah. Um, but really yeah. Another question. Yeah, it, it really, it really depends. Yeah. Why? What someone asked, why don't flowers more often self-pollinate rather than go through all of this procedure? Yeah, no, it's, it's why, why bother with sex? Um, and that, there's 20 minutes of talk, which I had to cut out because usually I would give an hour long talk on it, of what the point of, have, of, of sex actually is. Um, if you think about the, um, the, the, the downsides to inbreeding, it's basically that. Um, if, you can, if you can cross out with, uh, with other plants, then you bring in genetic material, which you don't happen to have. And that will help you survive all sorts of trials and tribulations. So if, let's say there's a mutant which has developed drought um, resistance. If, if you can't um, reproduce sexually, then, um, when, then that, could, that will die out. Yes. Um, if, if it is, let's say it's, it's resistance to, resistant to drought, but it's not resistant to a particular disease. If there's a disease, that will die out. Whereas if you can get sexual reproduction, then you can swap all of that genetic material over um, and it, it allows for, for mixing. I believe in support of that, they've, they've said that um, of all the plants that are currently, you know, I think maybe 70, 80 percent of them do require sexual reproduction. Um, whereas the tendency is for a plant to go towards self-pollination and, and the way you resolve that is that people, plants over the millennia have gone to self-pollination and then become extinct. Yep. So there is, is quite possibly that. Yeah. It's also notable that quite a lot of crop plants are self-pollinating because it's a really desirable trait yes. um, for crops, <laughs> yes. um, but, um, but not for a wild plant. One of our listeners mentions that you you said about the two sperm cells going down mm. the pollen tube. Mm -hmm. um, what happens if one doesn't make it? What happens if only one uh, gets through? Good question. So the um, they both fertilize different things and they're both needed. So if they don't both get through, then your seed will likely abort um, and you won't get a fruit or a um, uh, or a seed from that particular pollination event. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question as to the extent that um, pollination increases. I mean, um, rape is a, a popular crop for beekeepers to take their hives to. Do you do you know what sort of um, increase in yield can happen with a with a hive of bees in a field? So that's that's very interesting. There was some re research recently, and I cannot. Um, I. I it's in my inbox and I, I've read the summary of it, but I haven't read the full thing, um, which was showing that when you take, uh, when you look at pollination on a soft fruit farm, pollination is increased when you allow wild bees to visit your crop plants. Pollination decreased when you also had a honey beehive there. <laughs> Um, so pollination is good. Pollination by wild insects, as opposed to honeybees, is best Ooh. for for the plants which they were looking at there, which, which I think were soft fruits. Um, I'll find the reference for it and I'll send it to you, so you can send it round afterwards if people want. Um, there is no question that adding insects increases yield in many different um, crop plants. Um, for strawberries, it's something like forty percent increase in yield and quality um, when you add when you add insects. But I think that was done with bumblebees, um, and there's a slight complication because there are also some wild bees, but they don't know what they were. Mm. Um, but yeah, you, you can you can get quite a lot more. <laughs> I'm sure that this will all will start to develop all sorts of uh, people saying, "Well, I take my bees to the borage." 
I know. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of interest in your wiggly flowers. Um, yeah. Yes. And one, there's uh, people asking, is there a theory on why they prefer wigglier flowers? It's something to do with how the images are formed on the bee's retinas. So all of the hexagons in a bee's eye, each one of those is a, um, has a separate retina at the bottom of it, if I've, if I've got this right, or is a separate um, light detecting unit. And the way that that information is translated into an image means that the image is more visible if you've got a broken edged thing than if you've got a smooth thing. That's about as far down zoology as I can go. <laughs> Um, but it, it's it's something to do with that. There's some work by um, Miriam Lira from the 80s, 90s, I think it is, um, if people want to go, uh, go hunting on that. Right. Um, and there's also one by Teal and Ashman in, in 2000s looking at the, um, uh, but that's not looking at vision. That's, that was where they trimmed the flowers. Okay. So that will have some citations in it as well. Gino asks, is there any correlation between high B bean yield sorry let's do it again a correlation between high bean yield in, in brackets mass and high volume high sugar con concentration of nectar don't know um there is somebody in our lab at the moment who is looking at exactly that so give him another year or two he's, mm. he's just thinking about his um his research plots up in Peterborough at the moment and drilling them and watching them. And he's going to be harvesting the beans and checking pod size, number of beans, yeah. wet mass, dry mass, the lot. Right. So he'll be able to tell you that in a couple of years time. Well, that's good. I'll, I'll that's book him for you now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I guess that's, that's the, the point there is that there's no point in, uh, if you get high, you can breed high volume, high sugar content in, but, and there's no mass in the beans. There's not going to be a lot of incentive for the, for the growers. No, um, the, but the key thing there is if the, if the nectar that the, um, that the plants produce, if it's more energetically rewarding for the insect which visits them, but does not not noticeably increase the amount of time that the insect spends on the plant, then that is good. We have provided a benefit to the insect with no detriment to the crop plant that we're growing um but yeah you're, you're quite right if there's if there's um if there's no correlation and there's no benefit for the beans but there will be benefit if the farmer is growing other things which need pollination as well within the radius that your insect flies okay right i'm just going to there's, there's lots of bits and little little questions here but um i think we've we are, just ask why, you know, I, I, I saw why not why not native honeybees um, because if I have honeybees, I've got to have 50,000 of the things and deal with honey. And bumblebees, I've got 200 of them in a cardboard box. Yeah, they're easier to work with in the lab. Yeah, so. massively easy to work with. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was one about, uh, is it true that uh, almonds are 100% dependent on um, insect pollination? Um, it depends on the variety. I think there have been some selfing ones introduced in the last few years. Yeah, um, so. But I think there are also some diseases which were affecting them and they were just spreading viciously through it. Um, almonds are terrifying um, in America. Just the scale of the operation and the, the amount of bees that get dumped into them. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, somebody says it's fragrance factor. Yes, I'm not looking at it. Um, <laughs> it's another one which I would love to look at, but measuring fragrance is incredibly complicated. Um, so I'm just ignoring that. We can do experiments to, um, to see whether bees can tell the difference by putting two plants underneath black um, uh, covers with mesh tops. We reward one, we punish the other, and if the bees can learn to only go to the reward, then we can tell that they can tell the difference. If they can if they keep going 50 50 to both of them then we can't so that's a way of being able to tell whether it matters without bothering to do the analysis thank you hamish that's You're very well brilliant um and uh, i'll hand back i think to richard to uh, close the evening out thank you isla and hamish for um really fascinating and thought-provoking talks lots to think about there thank you bob actually also for fielding the questions um using your very obvious 
scientific understanding. I'm glad it was you, <laughs> not me. And finally, of course, thank you to all of you for coming along this evening. Uh, fantastic numbers, lots of you watching, coming in for these interesting talks. Don't forget that um, both of our speakers tonight will be writing uh, for Beecraft in the future. So if you're interested in reading more, um, do subscribe to the magazine. Uh, thanks again. Lovely to see you all. And hopefully we'll see you at a future event. Bees, bees, hark to your bees.